Thank you very much for the organizers for letting me speak at the, the very end. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I thank Dennis for brought us, you know, bringing us here together. And uh, so I'm going to talk about the renormalization and the typing theory. This is the title I gave uh, before I came here, but probably I'll be uh, shifted to uh, parabolic renormalization. So, well, before I start, I want to, uh, let me see, it doesn't work. Uh, say something about Dennis. So my first encounter was from this uh, preprint from IHS. Uh, it's the same at one as, as the current show. That one was the published version, and this is a preprint. And uh, so that has already changed uh, my life completely. And uh, well, first I read the preprint, I didn't understand the words. Because, uh, well, uh, because of my lack of knowledge, but also his style of very informal discussion of the matters. Then I went to learn the things like prime and the invariant functions and the quasi conformal mappings and typing theory. I went back to the, uh, the preprint and then it was uh, very intuitive and very helpful for understanding. So, and after I met the ladies and attended his seminars, uh, of course, as everybody says, it's uh, really influential and infectious. And uh, well, his style, and he asks questions, and he interacts with speakers, he intervenes. <laughs> and I remember one seminar, probably at the IHS, speaker was uh, talking about the PDEs, so he wrote the formula, 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 and so on. Then uh, Dennis stopped the speaker and said, I don't want any more formula. <laughs> Explain the idea in English. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, probably, I hope uh, Dennis can explain what he's doing now in English without <laughs> using algebra. <laughs> so, anyway, I try to speak English today as much as possible. Okay? Uh, so, uh, well, one example of Dennis' uh, expression of mathematics is, uh, well, this is a good ex uh, example, the KBS distortion theorem, which is often used in dynamics from a long time ago. The official version of the theorem looks like this. So when you have a polymorphic injective functions, you have a bound on derivatives of this formula, and the Dennis' version is this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and uh, <laughs> light can spread all over, but if you go into the certain radius, then it's almost intact. <laughs> By the way, I took to this uh, egg on the fine farm, which has this name. I'm <laughs> like Well, that was not interpreted by this. Okay, so. As uh, Michel Levitch mentioned in his talk, uh, Dennis gave an uh, ICM talk in 1986, and uh, he laid out the program using the type theory for, uh, to deal with uh, the denomination theory for uh, Feigenbaum type maps. And uh, the crucial point is uh, the use of type uh, metric so that it contracts in a natural way. Okay? So basically, you have this situation like this, and on the stable manifold, you want that uh, everything contracts, and uh, whenever you start from two points here, they are attracted to the fixed point, so in fact, the distance should go to zero if you measure in the right distance, okay? And, uh, well, when you don't know much about uh, the max, the, well, if you can differentiate and so on, then you can do a lot of things, but uh, it's very, uh, well, in a sense, a complicated uh, construction for uh, the renormalization operator. So one way to get the contraction is this uh, schwarz thick lemma over, from uh, complex analysis. That whenever you have a monomorphic mapping, then it doesn't expand the distance. And uh, well, this uh, time space version is a Poincaré distance. Yes, this is the Poincaré distance of D. And uh, for this is a version for tight space of Riemann surfaces. Then whenever you have a holomorphic mapping, 
then it doesn't expand the uh, uh, distance. So probably I should say in English, non-expanding, and uh, this one has, uh, it's a Kobayashi metric. Taikinaga metric is Kobayashi metric. Okay, so uh, the overall plan of Venice was to start with real bound on real line, say you go to the co uh, complex bound on complex plane, as uh, uh, Misha and uh, Jeremy described, you have a small domain going to the larger domain, and uh, you need to give an estimate of the modulus of these annulus. So for the sequence of renormalization, you have, want to have something like this, with a fixed number n, a positive number. Okay. And then once you establish this, then you go into this scheme uh, to get, uh, well, a little bit more than this, and uh, you want to have a factor less than one, and uh, what he did was, well, it was not uh, the situation you can apply immediately this situation, but they use, he simulates this situation by introducing the Heichner space for Riemann Sachs lamination. Okay. And well, there's a long story, but uh, well, uh, today I want to discuss a little bit about uh, another way of using this Heichner theory to get the contraction on some, uh, um, stable micro that uh, in another context. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about the so called parabolic uh, renormalization or near parabolic renormalization. And uh, well, this is a basic tool when you study the bifurcation of parabolic little points, and in particular, if you want to talk about the linearization of those irrational different fixed points. So, this is what you, of course, did already. And then you can talk, talk about the Ziegler disk and its boundary, or Kramer point, which means uh, it's a, a fixed point, irrationally different to fixed point, which is not linearizable. And then it's known that uh, the dynamics near such a fixed point is very complicated. There are sets called the hedgehogs, defined by Peretz Marco. So, this will be the tool to study those things. And hopefully, this may give some insight into satellite renormalizations, which is resisting this kind of uh, standard theory of renormalization. Okay. Well, this is not yet done, but uh, there are similarities going into irrational different direction and satellite direction. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is a priori bound in this setting and the renormalization horseshoe picture. Okay, so there's a big difference between this setting and the polynomial like renormalization setting, which uh, uh, Mr. Lubitsch and Jeremy Kahn talked about. So, for polynomial like renormalization, you won't have this situation. Okay? And uh, in particular, well, yesterday Jeremy cried for uh, space, <laughs> more spaces, but uh, in my setting, uh, a space will not be given. Okay? So, not enough space. So, you have to think about the different space. And uh, that's uh, the big difference in the theory. And uh, I'll talk about the, what kind of a priori bound you should look for, and uh, how you can get uh, this uh, immunization posture, in particular, this contracting idea using Taikina theory. So use use Taikina theory to get the contraction. In fact, I'm going to use, uh, in a sense, a ready-made Taikina space. You don't have to invent a new Taikina space, but I'm going to use the the type of space of puncture disk with all boundary map. So it's infinite dimensional, but uh, it's a nice object. Separable? Sorry? Separable or inseparable? Uh, it should be separable, yeah. And uh, one comment about the dictionary. So the parabolic period point coming here will be correspond to the cusps uh, in the inclining group settings. And uh, well, today I don't talk about the Rabos map, but there is something for the Rabos map which corresponds to a geometric limit in Kleinian group setting. And uh, yesterday there was a discussion about, uh, like, in, at the uh, infinite end, uh, <coughs> short cross to geodesics, and that will correspond to the large questions in the continual fraction expansion, which appears uh, in a moment. So, if when you have irras uh, irrational in different uh, fixed point, you have a irrational number as a rotation number, and you can write down the uh, continual fraction expansion and look at the questions. And the, there are large, sometimes there can be a large questions, and that corresponds to short cross geodesics. So for those who are more familiar with the Kleinian group. And uh, well, I thought if I have time, I may mention some other technique 
using this Teichmuller theory, very similar to this contraction mechanism, to prove uh, uh, the rigidity result by Liubich and Grachuk Sviantek for infinitely renormalized real quadratic polynomials, but probably I will not have time. Okay, so first uh, look at the, the phenomena, what happens uh, when you perturb the parabolic picture point. So this is the Julia set. Well, this Julia set is the boundary of this region, and for the map z squared plus one quarter. And I'm going to perturb this map into a certain direction. In particular, uh, one quarter is around here, and I'm going to perturb in the along the cusp. Going into this direction is not interesting, so you want to go along the cusp. And this is a movie. So you see some well, sudden change when you have uh, this black, completely black picture, then uh, Julia said changes, and uh, uh, it changes con discontinuously. And for uh, later usage, I prefer uh, another uh, notation for these same functions. Uh, I move the fixed point to the origin. So here, fixed point has uh, derivative one, and then I will perturb it in a direction that the, the derivative has e to the two pi alpha, where alpha is real or close to real, okay? Then observation is that uh, uh, at the perturbation of uh, c equal one quarter, the Julia set may uh, change this continuously, which was uh, discussed by Duardi. And then also it becomes richer after, as soon as you perturb. Remember, before you, you perturb, the Julia set was very nice Jordan curve, but uh, as soon as you perturb, the Julia set becomes more complex, complicated, and uh, it becomes uh, richer. And, uh, well, uh, well, well, zero for this normalization is a cusp. Yeah. The fixed point is and, uh, well, I took uh, advantage of this complexity to prove that uh, the, there are many uh, quadratic polynomials with uh, Julia sets of household dimension two, and also the boundary of Mandel set as household dimension <coughs> two in parameters. The basic reason is that here, uh, before perturbation, you have a, a parabolic fixed point, but after you further, you they bifurcate into two fixed points, so there are orbits coming in, can escape from here, or go around and come back again, so the returning orbit will create a more complicated structure. And you have to analyze it. And this is a scheme uh, developed by Duardi, uh, Hubbard, and Labos. Labos is a student of Duardi. Yes. Okay, so this is a uh, mapping before perturbation. You have a fixed point. And the orbit is from this direction come in. And this, this side will go out. So attracting side and repelling side. So I, I drew a curve and its image, and another curve and its image is going out. So both sides you can draw uh, uh, these cross and shapes. And if you glue these boundary curves by the dynamics, you get the topological cylinder. Actually, uh, this map is analytic, so you get the Riemann surface, which is isomorphic to C over D, the by infinite cylinder. Okay. Then if you look at the outside, like a point around here, tip of the cross sum, it goes to the other side by the iteration. So it, that means in the quotient, you, if you pick a point, the orbit will arrive to the other side. So that will define so-called the home map, which I did not EF know. So well, it's only defined in the neighborhood of the tips, and it's a mapping from this side, so from the pairing side to attracting side. This is one uh, object. So if you perturb uh, f so that the derivative is e to the 2 pi i alpha, where alpha is small with argument bounded, or if it's alpha is real, argument is zero, then what happens is that you still have these regions, fundamental regions, but uh, the tips are two fixed points now. They bifurcate into two. And so you can do the same construction gluing the, uh, the, these two curves, you get the two cylinders and the mapping home map from this side to this side, depending on the tips of the cylinders. And then the orbit going from here to the other side going through. So that, oh, so first of all, up to here, this construction depends uh, continuously if you normalize it in a suitable way. 
that uh, this new thing, because, because of this orbit going through, uh, there is an isomorphism from this string that, into th that string. Okay? So if you start from here, can come here, and then go through and come back again. So that means you can define the return map. And uh, this one, well, af after suitable re uh, normalization, you can explicitly write down, it's just a translation by a constant, and constant is completely determined by this alpha. And then, composing two maps, you get the return map. At least in the neighborhood of the, uh, the tip, it's a first return map, and it's a composition of these two maps, and one of them is this isomorphism with explicit constant. Okay? And what's important is that... Uh, so the compositions define, take, take like the upper piece, or...? Yeah, so, well, there are two pieces, and, uh, well, at this point you can define both of them, but okay. later I'll take only half of them. And so, well, this return map first forms the orbit going here and coming back. And what's important is that this part is continuous. So the return map for the perturbed system can be understood by this one with a small perturbation and this exact formula. And this is just a translation by this constant coming from the rotation map. But this is a very important fact. So home map is continuous and the only difference uh, it's making by this one is this rotation number, one over r. Okay? And since this is the c over v, well, you have to consider not only one over alpha, but the one over alpha modulo v. That's important. Okay? So now I can define parabolic renormalization, just to draw the same picture here, the cross sun and cylinder and home map. So instead of taking this c over z, the cylinder, uh, well, I consider uh, the exponential map, which is an isomorphism of C over D to punctual plane, C star. Uh, so I prepare these maps both sides. Then, well, we, I have these uh, two regions where this map is defined. So the top, uh, the top end corresponds to the, to the neighborhood of the origin, lower end corresponds to the neighborhood of infinity, and uh, this home map will induce the map from here, oh, I'm sorry, it's a map from here to there, and uh, that's the definition of uh, uh, parabolic renormalization. So this is conjugated by exponential map. But uh, well, the choice of this cylinder, you have uh, one parameter to adjust because uh, you, well, you can move by the translation by some constant. So you normalize some, some way, and you adjust this normal, uh, parabolic renormalization in a way that you have uh, derivative one at the origin. So it extends to the origin as a holomorphic map, and uh, you can adjust the normalization in the way that the, the map has a derivative one. So again, this is a parabolic pixel map. Okay? So this is the normalization. Well, in terms of home map, it's, uh, it looks like this. Okay? So next, it's a near parabolic renormalization. So all, you had almost the uh, same picture, and it had two cylinders. But now we have identification, so you, I only need a half of them. And then you take exponential again. Uh, this is a near parabolic denormalization. So when the perturbation is small in the right direction for rotation number alpha, this is always defined. And uh, well, it, it, this induces a re, uh, return map in the puncture plane. And well, this time, there isn't much choice for normalization, only one linear change of coordinate for this one. So the derivative is completely determined by the original uh, derivative of f at the fixed point. So for, well, I say this the origin is uh, here, and there's another fixed point, but uh, the derivative at the origin is e to the 2 pi i alpha. Okay? Then you can write down the derivative this way, where this beta will be minus 1 over alpha. This corresponds to the fact that this chi was uh, z goes to z minus 1 over alpha. And since you take exponential, you get this part. Okay? Well, you can express in this way. Alpha equals uh, integer minus beta. So this gives you already a flavor of continuous fraction expansion. So in, in Mr. Yankovsky's talk, uh, he defined a very, uh, the same, or well, more same uh, direction. And uh, the Combinatorics or rotation number have this Gauss map, and this is the reason that you have this Gauss map for uh, governing combinatorics.
And if you continue, you get a continuous function. And uh, as I mentioned uh, before, by the continuity of home map, uh, so if you want to know the return map, basically what you want to know is the, the parabolic renormalization before the perturbation, and then uh, after perturbation, you will have to know the rotation number, but the, the, the perturbed map, the near parabolic renormalization almost looks like this. So this part is uh, coming from parabolic renormalization, and then you multiply it by this factor of coming from mass, minus one over R. So this is the definition. Okay. Just to remind you the picture, and for parabolic, you have to two, take the two cylinders, but for or near parabolic, after you bifurcate, it, you just need to take this one. And uh, well, so there are two ends, but uh, I'm going to take the end, which correspond to the top end, which correspond to the origin of the original map. So I'm focusing to one of the pixel points. So then first, you draw the pixel domain <coughs> of, of the renormalized map? Uh, yeah, so this yellow region will be the domain. So at least uh, at this point. The chalkboard, and the chalkboard, but where's the domain? Oh, uh, here. Uh, it will be, well, if you just transport it, it will be something like this. Well, so if you continue, it will change by the iteration, so let me fit, stop up here. Okay. No, the whole renormalized map, what's the domain of it? Whole renormalized map. Well, the re this is uh, the map, and this is the renormalization, and you want to so on that say, plane, where's, yes? the, where's the domain of R of F? Well, our of f lives here, and our uh, of f corresponds to the orbit going around, around, around. Okay. So if you continue too much, then it, it screws up. Okay. So you have to so somehow. Is r of f conjugate to a map defined on a neighborhood of that upper fixed point? Uh, well, in some sense, yes. If you cut the domain, if you cut out the domain, oh, and see. take the first return map. Oh, this is blue. Yeah, now which becomes this continuous. So this, so this Sector is like the right, right. Blue yeah. Okay, In, instead of sector, you take the same. Okay, so if you take this domain, you get the discontinuous map. But once you grew, you get the nice map. Right, right. Okay, good, good. This is the point. Well, this is the close to what Yokos did. Yokos, what Yokos did was using this, just the sector. So you didn't need the other pixel form. But once you have this whole city, that you get a unique conformal structure on the city. Okay, so let me just define the space of uh, rotation numbers. Here, I'm, I'm going to take a set of rotation numbers with a large question. So I, I fix large n, I talk about it later, but then a space of irrational n will be the rotation numbers, the irrational numbers of, with all questions larger than n. So a lot of people like uh, the bounded type irrational numbers, which has opposite inequalities, and the people's favorite is the, uh, uh, the golden mean, but somehow I have a different direction <laughs> I want to go. Okay. So this has full measure? Uh, no, because if you exclude oh, this, uh, one, one, one end. The bounded one has the measure zero, though, right? Uh, right, right. But uh, well, so far there are a lot of work towards this bounded type or slowly growing the uh, continuous fraction that I want to focus on the complement. So what I'm interested in will be the case where these numbers grow, in fact. Okay? Then I define the space of functions. Probably at this moment you don't want to pay too much attention to this one, but uh, my function will be some fixed map with a critical point and the univariant function inverse. Okay? There's a fixed domain, and uh, you just to take the inverse of that and then apply a fixed map. And uh, so domain varies. But anyway, uh, what we could do with this definition is that, uh, well, this is a theorem with Eno, Hiroyuki Eno, my, my colleague. So if you choose 
the, well, yeah, I have chosen V, but uh, choose the domain V and large N, then you can define a set of functions of this form. So function this form multiplied by rotation, where rotation number is coming from this step. Okay. Then you can define the near parabolic renormalization in this way. Uh, and uh, well, this is invariant under near parabolic renormalization. First, it's defined. So this, there are those fundamental domains and cylinders. And the, after you define it this way, it belongs to this set again. And the quadratic polynomial itself doesn't belong to this set. But once you renormalize it, it belongs to this set. Okay. And furthermore, so this is the a priori bound path. So somehow this is a nice class of maps, and you, you define this invariant. Then after that, you get uh, the hypericity. So, well, here there are two directions, alpha direction and the f direction. So alpha direction, you act as the Gauss map for continued fractions, so it's expanding. And then the other direction, f, in this direction, the renormalization is uh, contracting, uniformly contracting. So the picture would be like this. So alpha direction is this way, and f1 direction is this way. So expand this way and contract uh, in the codimension one direction. So this is a statement. So uh, before talking about uh, proof, I let me say something about applications. The first one was Gunther uh, and Schelter. Well, they used uh, three different kinds of renormalization, so Yokos and McMullen uh, and mine. And uh, they showed that uh, there is a, a quadratic Julia set with positive A. Okay, and uh, well, they can show it for different types, but uh, we using a similar technique. And another uh, uh, application is if, if you take the uh, mapping of, from this family, or maybe quadratic polynomial, and suppose uh, uh, you have a uh, Ziegel is, is linear at the origin, so it's known that you need a Bruno condition, then you have a Ziegel disk for the domain of linearization, I can show that the boundary of the Eagle disk is always the Jordan curve. And this function. So, oh, sorry, I forgot. Alpha must be in this uh, Euras R, N. So the question should be greater than or equal to N. Okay, so here. The they asked if it was a, a rectifiable curve, and they said no. How much they asked, is it a quasi circle? Uh, well, probably it depends. On the rotation number, so and uh, well, so Buch data showed uh, in a different setting that uh, there are smooth boundaries, the, so they can find show the existence of the rotation number, so that uh, there, uh, there's no critical point on the boundary and the boundary is smooth. But uh, here, under the condition of uh, this ro uh, rotation number, or any case, you have a chosen curve boundary. For zero. And another case is that uh, not. Uh, non-linearizable, so it's a Kramer point, a fixed point, then you can find some, uh, some invariant set containing the zero and critical point, and the mapping is homeomorphism, and it consists of arcs, continuous arcs, uh, ending at uh, the origin. And if you take, take the two such uh, maps with the same rotation number, then it's uh, rigid in the sense that you can have a QC conjugacy on this invariant set, and uh, it can be asymptotically conformal uh, to all the critical, critical volume. So the invariant set should look like this. This is a picture of Perez Marco when he defined the hedgehog. And uh, well, this confirms that it consists of these arcs. So let me go to the proof of this uh, a priori bound. So the claim was that the first, this uh, space of function was the invariant under uh, the near parabolic renormalization. But actually, I, work, I first work on uh, parabolic renormalization, so before perturbation. Okay. So it was defined for parabolic map, where this is uh, one fixed point and derivative one. Then I had this picture, and this map was uh, uh, under suitable normalization. This is parabolic renormalization. So this is the case where. Two fixed points, right? 
Okay, uh, the, the claim was that uh, for this parabolic renormalization, the, the space of function I define is invariant. And once you have this, uh, I mentioned that uh, the homework is continuous, so you can use a continuity argument to show that, uh, uh, well, for, for this irrational case, again, this set is invariant if you pick a large M. So core is uh, to show the, the invariance for parabolic renormalization, then you use a continuity argument for, for irrationally indifferent case. So what's the idea of the proof? First of all, uh, well, probably you may not remember the definition of the space of function, but uh, what's, it, what's important is that uh, I define a space in this form. So this was a fixed function, and this was a varying function for an equivalent function with the inverse. Okay. And, uh, well, so this construction, either this one or that one, involves the uniformization of cylinder. So start with this domain and identify the boundary curve that get the cylinder, and then it's uniform as, as a C over Z or a function like this. But in general, from here to there, you have to uniformize this as a Riemann surface, and it's a very transcendental procedure. So you can't, in general, write down explicitly how it looks. So in the construction, it involves this uh, transcendental procedure. So in this sense, you can't really calculate the Taylor question of this function. So you can't look for some estimate using the, these uh, derivatives or question. So you have to look for something else. And uh, what I'm doing is not not looking at the derivative or anything, but instead I try to look at some kind of covering property. It's not really a nice covering, it's a partial, incomplete covering, that somehow some region will be mapped, uh, covered three times, another region is covered once, and so on, with a critical point, and then try to look at this pattern of covering, and to then from that information, I try to recover the properties of renormalized map. So, to say that some space of functions is invariant under this construction, you have to have a criteria that this one belongs to this function, family of functions, and I have to give, well, since I don't know the, the, question, the Taylor question, I have to give up the way to use the, the derivatives of the question. So instead of, I try to characterize those functions in terms of some kind of geometry or covering properties, covering pattern. And, uh, well, of course, to justify these arguments, uh, I have to do a lot of uh, estimates, inequalities, and so on. So those inequalities, I can't explain in English, and so I try to skip it. <laughs> <laughs> now, by the way, uh, important estimates are like a KV distortion theorem, or sort of the variant, or Bohusian inequalities. That's uh, <laughs> using it. Okay, so well, I try to show you a heuristic idea why I want to characterize the space of function as something like this, where T is defined in a fixed domain with some normalization like a 0 goes to 0, derivative is 1, and plus QC extension. This is a uh, not needed right now, but uh, I need it later. Okay. And this should be even. Monomorphic and injected. Okay. So uh, let me go <coughs> graphical here. So the checkable pattern. So this is a Julia set of the z squared plus one quarter or this map. And the fixed point is here. The origin is here for this function. And I Inside there is a parabolic basis, so the point attracted to this fixed point. So I, I color coded uh, the domain, and the explanation is the following. So I change this coordinate so that uh, the fixed point goes to infinity by minus one over w, and uh, the formula will look like this. It's almost like a translation, so it's easier to deal with. And then in the, this coordinate looks like this, so it has a critical point and a critical value, and the color code comes from the right-hand side. 
So on the right hand side, if you go far away, it really looks like a translation by one. So here you can conjugate this dynamics, capital F naught, to the translation by one. And uh, for example, this curve and its image will go to vertical strip. So it's a holomorphic map and nice with nice uh, bounds on the derivatives from on. So you can take the quotient. So it's a translation by one, taking quotient by z will be giving you something like this. So I mark this uh, pattern so that uh, this critical value will correspond to this uh, the cross point here and uh, some points on the cylinder. So I kind of put it in the two period three. So one strip will be going here and going here, and it's a period to period three. And then once you have this pattern by a two coordinate, this is called a two coordinate, you can pull back this pattern into this plane. So one strip will be coming like this, and try to keep pulling back by the dynamics into further in the inverse images. Here you have a critical value. So if you take the inverse image of this, it will be have a more branching. You have cross here, then uh, it's a double critical point, so you see more branching here. So the shape of the domain looks like this. And then if you take a further inverse image, the inverse image of this point will come here, or here, and so on. And uh, there are accumulation of further inverse images towards the Julia set, which is the Jordan curve on scale. This is the basic pattern, checkable pattern uh, of the dynamics. So basin can be color coded by this uh, algorithm. So just uh, take attracting side and uh, take uh, just the horizontal strips. Uh, and then uh, I usually take exponential map so that the top end is mapped to the origin, while this one will be mapped to somewhere, and this lower end will be mapped to infinity. And the other side, you, you also have this uh, strip like uh, domains. So fundamental domain, you can take it here. Uh, this curve will be mapped to here. So you can take the quotient also. And uh, when you take exponential map again, so if you take a top part, you see the domain like this, well, with, with the wiggly boundary, and with some color pattern inside. And that will come down here. Well, I didn't fill in here but uh, you should see some pattern like this. And then uh, the parabolic denormalization will be mapping from here, 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 and then follow the orbit, come here and down. Okay. So that means, well, within this picture, you should see this branching like this. So by orbit, you come here, the critical point goes to critical value, and here, and come down. That means there, there are critical points. There are many other critical points also uh, in this uh, map. Okay. So, and uh, this is a basic pattern, but uh, this is for this polynomial. But in my class, this is only a partially defined dynamics. So it, it has domain and it's, uh, well, that I don't extend to the whole uh, natural boundary, so you have to restrict the map. So you may not see a whole pattern like this. Like, like a quadratic polynomial. So you have to give up some part of this pattern. And uh, I decided to cut uh, this pattern at uh, some scale, uh, some uh, kind of shape of this way. And uh, then the next picture is not the whole picture of this, but the part of this picture. So well, since the, uh, the dynamics I have is only partially defined, I cannot guarantee that uh, you see the same picture, completely same picture as before. So what I try to see is only a part of this pattern. But you can still do the same, attracting side and uh, re uh, repeating side. So you see only part of the picture here now. And then take uh, exponential map. And if you cut up out by some height, then it will have some height here, and it will still give you some annulus and uh, you see this shape. Uh, then, well, if I can guarantee that uh, this picture, this pattern of this inverse image of this uh, attracting uh, uh, vertical strip, it, if it exists in this uh, dynamical plane, that means you see this pattern in the domain. So once you can see that 
this pattern is existing, then this pattern is in a sense universal. You see, for any uh, function, you see this pattern within the domain. So that means uh, you can go to the quotient and it's always, you always get the same pattern. So, so if you take the quotient by the dy uh, dynamics or get translation by one, or you, if you look at it carefully, you can see that uh, this is the same as this picture, but here you have to make a switch. Takes some time to realize that the, well, this one will be small, and uh, this around here, this part will be here, and uh, this part will be here, and then green and red will be here and here. So uh, that means once you see the pattern, you always have the same uh, isomorphic pattern inside this domain, and uh, the <coughs> only difference coming from each function is that the, this, the shape of this domain. So the shape of domain may change and do change depending on the particular function you take. So inside domain, it's universal, but the, the way you embed this domain into this cylinder or plane will be different. So this way, uh, you find some univariant functions which embed this domain into this is the functional plane. And uh, since this pattern is universal, you can fix one uh, representative for all, and uh, it happens to be this you know, cubic polynomial. And then the, the parabolic renormalization has this representation. So it's a, uh, this map is a P inverse composed with P. Okay? And uh, well, you take in fact a slightly smaller domain here, it's a technical thing. Uh, this is the definition of. Uh, 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 and in fact, uh, this is the way I define the region and the P and the P. So, well, if you agree with me, this is the, the almost the definition of this class of functions. Okay, so this is the way I detect that renormalized map is in certain class. And uh, I repeat that uh, this is a universal pattern, but the shape may vary, so it's absorbed by the uh, this invariant function P. So now you already have a bonus that uh, well, is parameterized by invariant functions, and the space of invariant function is uh, uh, compact with respect to the com uh, convergence and compact set. So you get already uh, some compact family of uh, functions. So instead of taking this uh, polynomial like map, I take this type of representation, and the compactness comes from. Here. So now it doesn't have the polynomial like, uh, mapping, but uh, well, this is uh, something you have to uh, be satisfied with. So let me go to the proof of contraction. So I have now this family. Uh, so as I mentioned, I showed you this picture, but I didn't say where to start. So once you have this map, you have to show that the, the picture that we saw is present in dynamical plane. So you have to do all the things. So again, you have to start with univariant function. You have this egg picture. And then you do all the kind of estimates that uh, you can actually define these orbits. Because uh, since it's partially defined, it may happen that uh, this orbit falls out of the uh, domain of definition. So you have to be carefully uh, estimated so that the certain domain do exist in the, the, the region. And that, I have to speak in English. Anyway, let me go to the contraction part. Uh, so once you have this invariance, uh, and uh, we want to get a co contraction in a stable direction, and uh, well, first, uh, using this uh, stability or continuity of home map, instead of working on this uh, return map of uh, uh, near parabolic renormalization, you can work on the parabolic renormalization where they take class. Okay? So you show the con uh, contraction for this one, and in the same way you can show the contraction for stable reduction of this one. So just for simplicity, I, let me talk about the parabolic. Okay. So now I have a space like this, and uh, it's the operator from F1 to itself, and let's recall the definition of R0. So we start with a map like this, 
and then take fundamental regions, uh, first in cylinders, in information, and first return map, and take expansion map, and uh, you got the result. Okay? <laughs> now, now you all remember. But we can't even compute, if you consider this way, you, can, you can't even compute these uh, derivatives and so on. Here are questions and so on. So don't drink all the definitions. Just to remember beginning and the end. And the intermediate thing is now uh, uh, just black box. Okay? But just to remember that uh, F1 has this form. Okay? So it, it's important that this one is fixed, representing the universal pattern inside the domain. And the event fun uh, this one is the event function representing the shape of the domain, and this is in the very uh, factor. Okay, and then there was a construction black box construction starting from one map. You create the renormalized map, which is, which has the same uh, representation, but in fact uh, through the construction you can show that uh, this extends slightly larger domain. So here. P is defined in a fixed domain, but the B prime will be a slightly larger domain. Okay? And uh, well, by the construction, it's easy to see that uh, this uh, new C will extend to the larger domain conformally. That's a slight bonus. And uh, well, construction is uh, holomorphic in the sense that if you take the holomorphic family of P, you get the holomorphic family of C. That's what you need to remember. Okay. Intermediate step is no, no more necessary. Okay. So, domain of definition for phi was B, and uh, you, it had extension, the after renormalization had extension to larger domain B prime. So, let me general the complement by W and W prime. Okay. So, W prime is to speak to smaller than this. It's a puncture plane, so infinity is a puncture. And, uh, well, I defined a tiny space for this uh, W. So, well, P was defined in B, but I now am interested in, in the complement. And uh, remember, I had a condition that the P extends to C as a QC mapping. So you take the QC, suppose you have a QC extension. So the tiny space here, you can represent as a space of Beltrami differential. And, uh, it's a quotient space where uh, equivalent equation is given by somehow giving the same boundary values for two sigma. So if two maps give you the same boundary values, so for example, mapping to the disk, then you are you identify. Then uh, the Heisinger metric on this space can be defined as a Finsula metric, the infinitesimal metric, integrating this infinitesimal metric, and the infinitesimal metric can be uh, given by the pairing with the holomorphic uh, quadratic differential. So integrable quadratic holomorphic differential. And uh, well, here, <coughs> we normalize the, the mass equals 1, and pair mu with this q, and take a super, uh, I have to take the real part. The real part of integral. Okay. This is the infinitesimal definition of the metric. Then, I have this space of functions and I identify, I'm going to identify the functions here with a point in Tychner space. It goes this way, so it has a phi in the definition, which is invariant with the QC extension to the complement. So just to take the QC extension in the complement and take uh, the Beltrami differential in the complement. So you, you completely forget about uh, what's happening in B, but you only remember what's happening in W. And that, that defines the well defined point in the Tychner space. So this gives you one to one correspondence between the space F1 and, and the Tychner space. So now we have this uh, near parabolic, uh, or parabolic renormalization going P, uh, P inverse to P C inverse, and uh, we know that this is going to F1. So by this correspondence, you got the corresponding element. But in fact, well, this one, I said that I have a slightly larger extension, conformal extension to the larger domain. So that means if you extend, try to extend this to a QC, well, near boundary, you already have a conformal map. And outside this larger domain, you have to extend to the QC. So maybe I should 
little picture. So if you put the infinity in the middle, W will be like this, and W prime will be something like this. So V will be outside. So for this one, you have a conformal extension up to here, then you extend uh, QC inside. So you can factor this uh, parabolic immunization into two, mapping tight final space of W into tight final space of W prime, which is this region. Then from here, if you have Beltrami differential, you extend to the Beltrami differential of W as a zero Beltrami differential outside. Okay. So that's uh, what I call C. So we have two things. But here, we know that this construction is holomorphic. So whenever you have a holomorphic mapping between tight space, it is not expanding by Rogan uh, Gardiner theorem. So what's remaining is that you want to show this part is uniformly contracting. Then altogether, this is not expanding, contracting, altogether to be uniformly contracting, you get the contraction, which was what you want. Okay? So just the argument for this contraction, it's very easy. So remember what was uh, needed was you have a smaller domain W prime and a larger domain W and the mapping C was defined by just uh, taking a bit of time differential in smaller domain W prime you extend to the <coughs> larger domain for putting zero in the complement. Okay. This is a well-defined map on type in a space and uh, the claim is that this is a contraction. But in fact you can uh, express the derivative of uh, uh, this map C in terms of infinitesimal type geometry. In fact, uh, well, from the definition of uh, uh, type geometry, it's obvious that uh, you have to calculate this ratio. That means, uh, well, you just calculate the domain corresponding to mu, then take the quadratic uh, Homomorphic product differential defined in this domain, and then, well, in the, the annulus in between, you be having a zero. So, in the image, you are only looking at the uh, uh, integral of of uh, q in this smaller domain, and uh, in the denominator, uh, you have an uh, integral over larger domain. Okay. So, the, this is the norm for. Uh, full domain and uh, well the mu you get will be zero in this domain so you only need to pair within this domain and the maximum possible value will be this absolute value. Okay. So you just need to estimate this ratio. Okay. And claim that this is uh, can be estimated by a uh, number less than one. More explicitly, so this uh, difference is an annulus. So the, this ratio is bounded by exponential e uh, uh, minus 2 pi times modulus of this annulus. So this comes from uh, modulus area inequality. So for Lubeck measure, well, it was used uh, for uh, showing the, the measure zero for cubic, certain cubic polynomials by Brandner Hubbard. There is an inequality be uh, between modulus of an annulus and the ratio of this k and uh, union k a and this was bounded by e to the minus 4 pi of the modulus so this was for ordinary uh, euclidean area but in fact uh, even for this quadratic differential there are similar inequalities and in fact the, the same inequalities uh, for the area form of a quadratic differential but they, so in fact, here I have a puncture this, so you have to put the one puncture, then you lose a, a one factor here, so you have to have a two pi. But anyway, that way uh, you can estimate this ratio only by the modulus of this uh, domain, and uh, so this will give the uh, contraction factor for this map. So altogether, you get the uniform contraction for denormalization. So this is the use of uh, one, one way to get uh, the uniform contraction for uh, renormalization. Okay, so I'm almost out of time, but uh, let me just say something about uh, another 
another application of this contraction, the same mechanism for contraction. So there is a theorem of Liouville Kurasek Subiantek about the rigidity of infinitely normalizable real quadratic polynomials. And uh, the crucial part was that if they have the same combinatorics, they are quasi symmetric, uh, quasi symmetric conjugate on their first critical set. And once you have that, you, there, you, there are some arguments to, to conclude that they are the same. And uh, after that, it concludes that uh, hyperbolic parameters are dense among real quadratic polynomials. So, density of hyperbolic. Okay? And uh, to do that, what you can do is, uh, well, there's a complex bound which is already mentioned by uh, Michel Lubitsch's talk. So now I'm back to real situation and I'm using this uh, space of polynomial maps. And uh, there's always bound for renormalization, so much lower bound on the modulus. Okay? So if you have a sequence of renormalization, and if you want to show the uh, quasi symmetric conjugacy, you only need to compare the two intervals which are adjacent with the same size and the show that they go to the uh, intervals of more or less the same size. So basically, you only need to compare the same size. So when you have a scale of renormalization, this is a schematic picture, like a log of k, k minus. So one renormalization may start here to there, and another renormalization may be responsible to here, and you can draw this picture, which corresponds to the, this picture, and this picture, and further down, and so on. And three points of the adjacent interval may come in here, you know, here, and they are taken care of by different stage of re uh, renormalization. So if you only need the quasi-symmetric conjugacies, each uh, pair of interval will be taken care of by e one of the renormalization levels. So what you need is only show the uniform uh, conjugacy or partial conjugacy for uh, polynomials. So what you want is instead of taking infinite renormalizable uh, case, just to have a one renormalizable case and try to make a conjugacy except in the middle of case part. So there you don't require that it's a conjugacy, but I, I require that it's conjugacy everywhere outside. And I, what I want is uh, the, the bound on the dilatation should be uniform with respect to the modulus of uh, initial polynomial like mapping. Because you, I have to argue, use this argument for this step, and this step, and this step, and depending on the combinatorics of uh, renormalizations, this, the difference of these scales may be very large. So in, independent of the combinatorics, you have to apply this argument. And now, uh, the second uh, argument is that you can make a Yonkos part of this, the partition of a plane, and uh, look at the, the middle piece of the uh, dynamics, and then you can take all the information backwards and refine the conjugacies, the almost conjugacies. So you can start with this middle part, then you can get a nice uh, partial conjugacy everywhere else. So that means that around the critical point, you take this Yoko's puzzle piece in the middle, and if you take two of them, and on the boundary of the Yoko's puzzle, there's a natural marking in there. And so if you can extend this natural uh, marking to a QC mapping with a bounded dilatation, then you are done, because uh, by putting back, you, you get a partial conjugacy. So you can just focus on the uh, central piece, and uh, Without the dynamics, you can just extend to a QC mapping, preserving the canonical marking on the boundary. Okay. So that's, uh, you can replace this uh, by a uh, uh, high map. So now the situation is the following. So usually this piece around the critical point looks very bad. <coughs> So there's no reason that, well, they, you can extend to QC, but the dilatation will be very bad, okay? But uh, <coughs> anyway, once you extend, this defines 
an element of universal tightness space, tightness space of this domain, because we take a electronic differential, and uh, equivalence relation is by boundary uh, relation. And then what you want is the, the estimate of the best dilatation of this map the, for the extensions. So that means uh, you compare with uh, the Beltrami differential of this one and the zero Beltrami differential. And you want to uh, have a bound which depends only on the initial modulus, not depending on the combinatorics of period of renormalization. Okay? Then what you can do is that you refine one more step. Now this is the outer uh, domain and put it out inside. So refinement, you can do the refinement one more time. Then what happens is that there are small pieces which maps equivalently onto the big piece. And uh, there's a central piece which maps two to one to the big piece. And there are many annuli, which has already nice geometry and uh, maps nicely to the uh, counterpart. Okay? So once you have this picture, so initial one and then the refined one, they, they have the same boundary values. And then by uh, combinatorial estimate, this is essentially due to your calls that uh, the, for each component, so the sum of moduli is uh, always bounded by some constant, positive constant independent of combinatorics, as long as the uh, period of renormalization is greater than two, so non satellite for real ones. Then uh, taking these uh, uh, maps, you can define the mapping, self mapping of the Teichner space, just inducing only on this red part, not on this one, the one to one part, original structure. But then what you can conclude is that uh, since uh, initial two maps have the same boundary value, you have a fixed point for this map. And uh, well, since you have enough modulus be between this bad one and the uh, uh, boundary, the distance between zero and its image is also uniformly bounded. Well, of course, uh, the, well, if you extend naively here, the, the dilatation will get worse. In fact, but anyway, but you get uh, the uniform estimate because you have enough space to adjust, adjust. And next thing is using the same inequality as I used for this modulus area inequality. You, you have a uniform contraction. So you have all three elements, and what you want to estimate was the distance between this fixed point. Also, this is a fixed point and the zero Beltrami differential. And in fact, once you have this, it's easy to see. <coughs> by contracting contraction mapping theorem that uh, this distance is depend, uh, bounded depending only on M, not depending on combinatorics. So somehow initially I started with a key note which was very bad. I didn't know how bad it was. And um, I made it even worse, T1. And, uh, and, but somehow after all I got uh, uh, this bound. So well, it's very bad today. And, uh, even worse tomorrow, but after all, it's, it, was, it wasn't too bad. Thank you very much. <laughs>